welcome to Gerard Alliance Church Online. I'm so glad that you decided to watch this video, and I cannot wait to see what God is going to do in and through this message. But before we start, would you take a moment and pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for this time together. And Lord, I just pray right now that uh, if there's any distractions, uh, anything in our our lives right now that uh, may be keeping us from you, Lord, would you would you reveal that to us? And God, I just pray that you will uh, speak life into us as we look into your word. Lord, we're so grateful and thankful for who you are and what you've done. And God, we give you the glory, honor, and praise forevermore. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, a few weeks ago we looked at Psalm 24. And near the end of the sermon I mentioned that this psalm was written by King David for a special occasion. More than likely he wrote this psalm with every intention of singing it at the inauguration of the temple of the Lord, along with the rest of the assembly of the Israelites. But David finds out from a word from the Lord that came by the prophet Nathan that he would not be the one to oversee, lead, and construct the building of the temple. Instead, it would be one of his sons. In fact, God tells him that it will happen when your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, which seems to be a harsh and yet soft way of expressing that the building of the temple will occur after he's dead and gone. As I was thinking about this, I wondered to myself, you know, how easy is it for me to trust God for what's to come? How easy is it for you to trust God for what's to come? Is it easy for you to trust God for what's to come? What about trusting God for the future of your family, for your children and your grandchildren? It's amazing to see the comparison between what I dealt with growing up and what my children are having to deal with. What about what's to come for our nation? And as a people, not only that, this may hit a little bit closer to home, but what about the church in America? What's to come of the evangelical church living in a post-Christian culture and world? I'm sure of it, that we've all had these concerns and questions run through our minds from time to time. And when push comes to shove, the main question I'd like us to answer is, are you going to trust God for what's to come? I love the lyrics to the song, Trust in God. It says, perfect submission, all is at rest. I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story and this is my song. Praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. I mean, there's this unwavering confidence in God. Trusting God over and above everything else is so important. I mean, listen, even when we may not have the answer for today, we know who holds tomorrow. Amen? We know who holds tomorrow. Charles Spurgeon said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but only empties today of its strength. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? What does Jesus mean by this rhetorical question? Well, he's making a pretty obvious and obnoxious claim that worrying about your physical stature or even your lifespan, it changes nothing. It changes nothing because both are a gift of God and are out of human control. David writes in Psalm 39, 5, You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. 
Everything, everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. So let me ask you, what are some ways that someone would seem secure, as David puts it here in Psalm 39.5? See, David admits to God in the verse right before this one, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Listen, here in, in this passage in Psalm 39, David does not inquire of the Lord when his life is going to end to make sure that he has everything in order or he's in right standing with God at the time of his death. No, he asks so that he is reminded and humbled by the fact that life is momentary. In a way, David wants God to put it in perspective for him. And there's one fact about all of this, all of humanity for that matter, no matter how much or how little we have, money and possessions dictate our way of life. If you ask me, wealth is a paradox. One person can have all the money in the world, and seem to be happy, everything at their fingertips, and yet in the next moment, they commit suicide because they feel that life is just not worth living. Another person can just get by, just have enough, or live paycheck to paycheck and be full of life, right? I remember I went down to Reynosa, Mexico on a missions trip when I was in 10th grade, and we went down into uh, one of the poorest populations of Reynosa, and there was a six-person family. Get this, six-person family. We built a house, or if you think about it, it's really a glorified hut. We built a house that was about the same size of my room at the time, and these people would have thought you built them a mansion. They were filled with tears of joy. Gratitude was exuding from every one of those people. Even their neighbors came by and, and shared in the joy of this newly built house. And I stood there awestruck, amazed, stunned by their gratitude and joy. You see, I'm, I'm thankful for that trip because God put life and wealth and possessions into perspective for me. I'm a firm believer that every single person in their lifetime should go on a short-term missions trip. Every single person in their lifetime should go at some point on a short-term missions trip because a short-term missions trip, get this, get this, because a short term missions trip has the potential to influence a long term change. Short term missions trip, but a long term change. So back to answering David's question in Psalm 39 5. The person that would seem the most secure would be the one with the most wealth, right? I mean, this was Satan's accusation against Job. Of course he's devout and committed to you, God, because you give him everything. You favor him. He has wealth beyond compare. Listen, when Job 1.3 states that Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East, that means he was the wealthiest. So here's the end all of end all questions when it comes to your finances and your money and your possessions. Are you trusting God for what's to come? Are you trusting God for what's to come? Today and next week we're going to look at a passage of scripture that seems a bit odd when it comes to talking about wealth. The main point that I, I want us to see, though, comes with a truth and a question. The truth is that everything is God's. That's the truth. And the question is, are you going to trust God with what's to come? Sure, maybe in this moment we can say, absolutely, absolutely, pastor, I'm going to trust God with what's to come. We may be more of a realist and say, well, I'd like to think so. I'd like to trust God. 
for what's to come? Or maybe we take the middle of the road approach, right? Well, it depends. It's a case by case thing. And wherever you would place yourself with the answer to this question, my prayer is that all of us at the end of this sermon series will be able to trust God more with our wealth and what he's given to us. So with that being said, please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 29, 1 through 9. 1 Chronicles 29, 1 through 9. The first part is not out of surplus, out of sacrifice. Not out of surplus, out of sacrifice. We're going to look at the first five verses. It says this, Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources I have provided for the temple of my God, gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stones and marble, all of these things in large quantities. Besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver, For the temple of my God, over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple, 3,000 talents of gold, gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings, for the gold work and the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? If you ask me, One of the most horrible moments in the history of prophetic voices within Israel comes through Malachi. Now, I I don't mean to say that it was horrible because of the prophet. No, no. Rather, the people were incredibly rebellious. Incredibly rebellious. His prophecy begins by Israel doubting God's love for them, which to start off with that train of thought and belief is just ludicrous, right? Right? I mean, that's an implosion waiting to happen. But listen, within four chapters, Malachi prophesies against Israel for breaking the covenant against God by these things. He says, giving blemish sacrifices, corrupt priests, through divorce and injustice, and lastly, by withholding tithes from God. Withholding money or tithes from God. The tithe that was set up was to offer the top. It was to give the best. We've brought it to an understanding of tithing 10%. But with, within Malachi's prophecy, it wasn't the quantity that God cared for, that, that they weren't giving their 10%. No, it was more so about the quality. They weren't offering their best. Why? What was happening? They were offering out of their surplus rather than their sacrifice. I mean, what happens if you give the top, the first? Well, initially you're sacrificing the best, right? The most worthy and valuable. The Israelites' gut reaction may have been, well, if we're going to give you the best of it, we may as well give you all of it. And that's exactly what God tells them to do. Malachi 3.10, God says to them, bring the whole tithe, the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Woo! But wait a minute now, God. You're asking us to give it all, not just a portion of it. That's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. What God is communicating to his people here is that when we give out of sacrifice rather than surplus, he will do even greater things. Hallelujah! 
I mean, listen to this promise. He says, I will pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. Listen, one way we can trust God for what's to come is to give out of a sacrifice, not just a surplus. Within this passage we're looking at, David makes a pretty bold proclamation to begin. We may be under the impression that he's still disappointed about not being chosen, right? Who knows? There may have been a little bit of regret or frustration, but that's not the key point I want to focus on. Within these opening verses, we see the posture of David's heart towards God and the building of his temple. I mean, when he gives this matter-of-fact statement about Solomon being young and experienced, I don't think it was a knock on Solomon at all or even God's choice to choose Solomon. More than likely, David was trying to make the point, especially talking to the entire assembly, that, listen, it's going to take all of us, not just me, not just Solomon, my son. No, it's going to have to take all of us. And it's just not... 10% of people that need to provide and give us for this palatial structure to be built. No, it's 100% giving out of sacrifice. You see, David wants to make it very clear. He wants to make very clear of the importance and severity of the task at hand. He says, the task is great because this palatial structure is not for man but for the Lord God. In a way, it's as if David is saying, hey, listen, if you were building this for yourself, you'd want it to look great. You'd want it to be great, the best. Our perfectionist tendencies would come out. Is it not even greater because this is for God? Okay, Pastor Lamech. <laughs> Uh, but how is this relatable to us? We're not building a temple anytime soon. True. But there are many opportunities to give out of sacrifice and not just surplus in your life. I bet you can think of a couple ways right now. You know, this isn't a personal advertisement for you to give more to the local church. This is not meant to guilt trip you into giving. But listen, what I will say is I, I think at different times and seasons in our lives, we need to do and to give a personal evaluation of what we're giving to God. How, how are we serving Him? How are you serving Him? Are you looking for ways to get connected and get involved? God has blessed us and given to us and he calls each one of us to be good stewards of what he has provided. And this, of course, is not just about wealth, although that's very important because that's what we're talking about right now, but it's also about our time and attention. What do we talk about the most? What do you talk about the most with people in church or neighbor friends or, you know, co-workers what do you talk about the most with family members? What matters to you? What do you think about? And, and what do you devote your time and attention to in a day or a week or a month or a year? What makes you tick? What makes you tick? Actually, David gives in two ways. First, I find it interesting that he starts with his surplus. He says, with all my resources I provided for the temple of my God, all of these in large quantities. He doesn't shy away from being open and honest about what he has given. All of his resources he has provided. All that he has acquired in his role as king. All that he's won and plundered. He gives it in large quantities quantities but what's so fascinating to me is that he is trusting God for what's to come 
You see, David already knows at this point the building of the temple will occur after he's long gone. And yet he still trusts God with what he has been given now. Second, and this is where the sacrifice comes in, he takes his giving one step further. He tells the entire assembly, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God over and above everything I have provided for this holy temple. This is his personal treasures. It's it's now bleeding into or covering over his personal wealth. And the two words, quite frankly, that make me cringe here is over and above. Over and above. That just sounds risky. Over and above? So let's say there's this requirement, right? This is how much we should give. For example, 10%. But now, David has eclipsed that. He's gone over and above. What would it take, church? What would it take, people of God, for us to go over and above to our giving to the Lord? How easy or difficult would it be for you to take that risk? In the least, may I ask that you prayerfully consider and evaluate how much you give and what you are giving to. From local church to nonprofit organizations to social justice initiatives to fundraising for a cure or, or raising funds to help build water wells in third world countries or to support missionaries or giving to your neighbor who's in need or a family that lost their loved one who was the sole provider. I mean, think about it. The sky is the limit for what we can give back to God. And it starts with giving not out of surplus, but out of sacrifice. Notice what David does here at the end. He starts by leading, by by setting the tone and being the example. And then he asks this, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? In other words, hey, who's willing to do the same? David says, who will join me in giving to the Lord? Who will provide what is needed? Who will give beyond their needs? Who will go above and beyond? Who will set apart? Who will be set apart for God's will and purpose? David started, he started it for sure. But who is willing to join him? In essence, who is willing to trust God? God for what's to come. Second, look at verses 6 through 9. Then the leaders of the families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave toward the work of the temple of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in the custody of Jehel, the Gershonite. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. There was a research study that was done a few years ago about how giving to the local church went down 20% within the last decade. From 2007 to 2017, there was a shift from tithing to the local church and giving to nonprofit organizations. It went from 37% giving to local church down to 17%. And you have to wonder and ask the question, why? Why did people stop giving to the local church 
All the while, nonprofit organizations were raising thousands of dollars. Well, for one, let's just paint it here. For one, we have seen a decline in church growth and church planning, and yet at the same time, there are multiple nonprofit organizations being started by the dozen. But you know, I think the second reason is the most important. Think about this for a moment. And I've said this before. It's easier to support and get behind an organization or a religious institution if you, one, know where your money is going and what it is being used for, and two, know that it's making a difference. Think about that. It's easier to give to something, whether it's a nonprofit organization or a, a religious organization, it's, it's easier to give if you know where your money is going and what it, it's being used for and know that it's making a difference. For King David in this campaign, there was no question of where it was going and what it was being used for. It was to build the temple, the house of the Lord. And, and David had, had provided out of a sacrifice and a surplus. And then he asked the bold question, who's with me? <laughs> who's with me? I wonder how long he had to wait. I wonder if there was any awkward silence. A moment that he had to look around a little longer and, and you know, give some head nods. Or maybe even reiterate the importance of what was being asked of the entire assembly. And I love, I love, I love, I love what follows. It was the leadership. It was the leadership. I truly believe that it was quick. It, it were the, it was those who held a position among the people of God who stepped forward. It was the leaders of families, the commanders and officers, the officials in charge of the king's work. It, it, it says that they were the people who gave willingly. You know, you may not think much of that word, but it's important. These people who are mentioned here, they are definitely able to give. They're able to give. There's no doubt about that. They had the means and the resources, right? Most, I would say, were well off. They had land, and they owned businesses, and, and they had good paying jobs, and they had uh, made a name for themselves, and they were good stewards of what God had provided for them. Listen, the ability was there for sure, but it's the sole fact that they gave willingly. There's a huge difference to being able to give and being willing to give. King David didn't force his hand on them. He, he didn't tell them, you know, give all or else, right? No, it says that they gave readily and freely. And, and we... Um, we, of course, cannot begin to imagine how much they gave. We're told how much, but in modern day, I would assume it would be way more than we can even think or wrap our minds around. But here's the beautiful truth in all of this. At this point, they're not only giving in quantity, but quality. They're giving God their best. Gold, silver, bronze, and precious stones. They're trusting God for what's to come. They have made the decision they're going to give to God what is rightfully His in the first place. And I love what this giving produces. It says, the people, the whole assembly, the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. So what was the response of their giving? Of the leadership's giving? That the people rejoiced. David rejoiced greatly. Listen, giving will always lead to a form of praise. Giving will always lead to a form of praise. And the whole assembly is not 
praising about the amount that was given, right? They're not necessarily pumped about the what. Rather, they are excited and influenced by the how. How did these leaders give? They gave freely and wholeheartedly. The whole assembly broke out in one accord to praise God. This would have been an incredible sight to see. My prayer for us today is that we will give, not just from surplus, but out of sacrifice. I pray that God will impress upon our hearts a desire to surrender all we have to Him. Furthermore, I pray that our giving will lead to a life of praise. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father God, this message hits all of us differently probably. But God, I pray that you will speak life into us. Wherever we are on in this journey with you, whatever you've provided to us, whatever we've already given or will give, Lord God, I pray that you will guide and direct us to the point that we trust you with what's to come. God, I pray that you'll give us the boldness, the confidence, and the faith to trust you for what's to come. And may you receive all the glory, honor, and praise. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Go in that grace.